Welcome, Adrian, to the this dialogue uh, about uh, the deep transitions work and how it relates to your work. Um, my opening question is about this relationship. Um, when I think about the deep transition uh, framework, in a way, it's a framework about the winners. You know, it's about the searches. It's about uh, the dominant uh, meta regimes. Uh, it's about what gets traction. Mm. Uh, your work on uh, social movements, grassroots innovation, is about the fringes, you could argue. It's about, you know, what happens outside the mainstream. And the question is, is there a relationship and between both? And if we would have to think about this relationship, how would we, or how would you frame that? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it depends what part of the world we're situating ourselves in, perhaps. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about these sorts of grassroots innovation movements and social movements, there may be parts of the world where actually what they're seeking to do and perpetuate is the mainstream. So maybe they're resisting modernity and they're trying to rethink ways of doing science and technology appropriate to their own histories and cultures. So it's really about not so much maybe marginal because it's very important to their worldview, their, their aspirations. So for, take, for example, maybe things like the people's science movements in India, which kind of began in the 1960s and is still very active today. You know, it's very much seen as something uh, about th trying to think about science and technology for an Indian perspective that was different to, say, Gandhian village self-sufficiency. And it was also resistant to kind of Nehruvian modernization agenda in post-colonial India. Um, so maybe the interesting question here is, is maybe what's behind it is not so much labels like fringe and marginal but it's about power relations and contestations perhaps between different ways of um conceiving and doing innovation perhaps um i mean interestingly then if we if we move ourselves from one context to another you know you think about um i i don't know the offshore wind farm here in the, the UK, you know, the, these new global green industries, uh, and you trace the histories of some of their core technologies, they could be traced back to grassroots movements, obviously, you know, and how the Danish wind industry developed more out of the alternative technology movement and was, according to research by Peter Carno and others many years ago, was, was more successful than some of the mission-oriented innovation being promoted back then in the 1970s in universities and research centres, you know, the big turbine designs that the engineers were doing were unreliable, didn't work. And most importantly, they lacked a social base to lobby and push for institutional reforms. Whereas in some places like Denmark, the movements had a social base that enabled them to make reforms and, and empowered them in some way. So it's a good question, that, you know, that, and of course, if you think about the current crises, this conjuncture of social, economic and ecological crises, and if you're talking about radical innovations, things that get, really get to the root causes of things, then maybe some of these grassroots movements, some of these grassroots initiatives are not fringe at all, because they're actually taking seriously um, a reordering of values that may be necessary to live more sustainably, you know, and, and to, to live within a single planet and to do that in a socially just way. So those aren't necessarily fringe concerns, but I, I take your point in terms of if you're thinking about the current institutions and who ha who is situated more powerfully in many societies and economies, then clearly those power relations situate the grassroots sort of at a, um, in many respects, are quite, what was I going to say, I was going to say disadvantageous or the weaker end of things. But actually, I think depending, you know, those those relations can shift. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and it's very complex, those relationships as well, isn't it? You know, some of the, 
as I've just been intimating, some of the ideas that develop on the fringes, as you put it, are now very successful business ideas and, and or technologies or um, business models or you know policies and so forth, aren't they? Um, whereas other aspects of these fringe activities are still too challenging for you know institutions to take in. You're responding in uh, bringing up a, a number of topics I, in fact, would like to discuss with you. Okay. Uh, the first thing is, uh, okay, you, in a way, challenge a bit the notion of fringe and mainstream. And, of course, it depends on your perspective. Mm. Uh, and I think that's an important point uh, to make. And the word fringe can, of course, mean not important. Uh, which is not what I implied. Why I implied that there's a bias in the deep transition framework, first of all, because it, it, it's, it's a typical bias, partly for history. History tends to look at the winners. Uh, and uh, there are good reasons for this, partly related to sources. Uh, you know, they also represent certain parties more than others. Uh, but with deep transition, the precise aim is to challenge the dominant practice. So we need to know the dominant practice in a way. And how did it come about? Uh, so the first idea in deep transitions thinking is that there is something like a regime. And a regime, of course, has a spatial and social reach. So some people will be less affected by it than others. And I would argue that the deep transition as a process has a clear Eurocentric and colonial features in it, you know, which started to influence the other world. So if you go to India, for example, when I was in Kolkata discussing mobility issues, uh, it, and well, it was very clear there was no space for more cars. A lot of people aspire to own cars. So the, a lot of the solutions they seek for their mobility problems are kind of influenced by a modernization paradigm, which really does not fit uh, their context. Mm. And so this is what I what you may call the power of the first deep transition, which delivered this kind of modernized, industrialized world we live in, and we need to challenge that. And the idea is the challenge needs to come from the fringe. As you know, we call them niches. Uh, and your work on social movement and grassroots, you know, they are challenging some of the dominant assumptions and deep rooted convictions. And uh, I recognize, as you do in your work, that this is something sometimes not because they want to challenge, this is just their way of life. Mm. So, in that sense, it's their dominant way of understanding, their dominant way of life. Uh, but still, we have to think about, I think, this relationship, because it does matter politically uh, mm. who wins. Uh, so I am always interested in in this question. Yeah. So, so, so who becomes more powerful and why and how can we distribute this? Mm. So would you agree with this? Yeah, no, I know. I think you're right. It is. It does boil down to questions of power, and and these are political challenges, and therefore, I think maybe questions of democracy and plurality come into this. And one of the interesting things with some of the, you know, what might be quite small scale grassroots innovation initiatives, you know, when you look at some of the specifics involved, whilst they can circulate very widely and they can be quite innovative, you know, um, quite well known or something like that. It's maybe one of the intriguing things, if you like, is not so much the, the instrumental impacts that they they have. And those those are important. And ultimately, if we, we you know, there needs to be some sort of material impact if we're to address some of these uh, sustainability challenges. But it's almost actually in opening up the space about think you know what does innovation look like when conceived through a different set of social values or reordered or um yeah a, a different kind of worldview 
I think you're right in terms of um, these being questions about power and politics and you know framing it as sort of dominant regime or you know very structured and structuring um, arrangements in societies that make change difficult or that channel change in certain directions versus this sort of um, more marginal or more weakly situated sets of activities that is really really important to get into that um, but I wonder if we have to unpack ideas of power a bit more and almost like the um, the power of example or the fact that these sort of grassroots initiatives are pointing to a diversity of ways of thinking about practicing innovation and that some of that diversity contributes in some way to public debates and provides a a, a resource or um, examples or points to whilst maybe fringe nevertheless a kind of opening up conversations about well why is it so difficult for urban food to be widely practiced in these ways say for example or you know why is it that um, the digitalization of electricity systems and smart grids and so forth assumes that users of electricity are simply customers you know why can't we use this, these techniques and technologies to enable a greater diversity of community energy initiatives or energy cooperatives or any citizens to participate who's going to own these technologies so looking at initiatives that may be on the margins and are trying to do things very difficult i think they do two things one they open up the space for debate and discussion yeah and sometimes maybe they pioneer practices that become mainstream that's one thing that they do i think the second is by being reasonable and demanding the impossible as, as the anarchists used to say they make perhaps more visible some of these structures and some of this dominance that you you mentioned Yellen, you know so if you're trying to get I know, permission to connect to the grid or you're trying to think about promoting cycling mobility in a city and you just then begin to see you know what you're up against if you like yeah. and it does reveal these questions of politics and power and maybe what what mobilizations are needed to overcome them um, the question is whether we can think a bit more radical about this in a sense that okay what you're saying the way i hear it is they challenge the dominant mainstream and open up new spaces so for the, and they have to respond to the dominant practice so this may shape the response and help moving the development in the right direction and sometimes they may even be upscaled and pioneer sort of practices that can be uh, adopted. Uh, let's say if you have a, a practice where you have uh, direct delivery from the farmer to, uh, pe to people in the city, this can then become part of a, a mainstream activity organized by larger food industries as a way. To, I mean, that's what you mean, I guess, for, as a way to delivering uh, uh, the question is whether we can also think of a more radical scenario where grassroots way of working would become the mainstream mm. because part of the modernization paradigm is we need universal standards uh, so there's so part of the deep transition thinking is that uh, we have the whole way, the, the way we provision energy, mobility, food is dominated by a set of principles, among others, globalization. Perhaps we need a complete new way of delivering on these basic needs. So you could also argue that the grassroots could become the mainstream, the way they work. Uh, but yet, when you look at the kind of practical examples at the moment, that prospects looks rather bleak. Mm. Uh, what do you think about this potentiality? Yeah, I think I, it's, it's difficult to talk generally, I guess. Um, but I agree that if you look at maybe, it depends on the societies you're looking at, but say maybe a kind of European society, then it does seem a stretch to imagine that we're all going to become um, 
participants in some of these grassroots initiatives in the form as they're currently practiced, if you like. So, um, but maybe, I don't know whether that's a kind of fruitful line of inquiry and thinking about what would need to change in order for these to become, like you say, the conventional mainstream way of doing things. Um, I'd kind of go back to what I was saying about it's not necessarily that everyone in a neighborhood is expected to behave this way or do what what happened what, whatever it's more i think maybe when citizens are exposed to some of these initiatives in their neighborhoods and it's like well they're doing it very differently and it just sort of um uh that kind of awareness and that thinking about plurality um contributes to the kind of public debate and discourse if you like and it's it's hard to know how these things are going to um coalesce or disappear or struggle or succeed through time i think but think um, about uh, if you think about the example of car sharing so yeah. suppose a number of people in the neighborhood agree not to own cars anymore to, and just have free cars together and set up a way of you know handling uh, the situation uh, and suppose enough people do that in the Netherlands and then it becomes the dominant trend in the Netherlands because they set a social norm and part of the deep transition thinking is that people are driven by rules uh, and uh, so these are the kind of routines that become embedded in the infrastructure mm. and in the products and in the regulation and in the culture so from my perspective we could assume a situation where mm car sharing becomes the dominant uh, norm uh, and this relates to the notion of fringe because one of the crucial aspects of social life is the bandwagon the the s-curve so change comes with bandwagons and this is deeply so you need to and if you set the right kind of norm then you generate the bandwagon uh, and it mm -hmm. looks like social movement always stay below the threshold. So there is a quantitative part. Yeah, I, I don't see it quite so mechanically, I don't think, in the sense that those sort of norms, if you like, um, if you look where they come from, I mean, at the moment, there's a lot with, you know, with, with pa the pandemic and lockdowns, the idea of the 15 or the 20 minute city has become entered into the public discourse. And if that became, so, you know, institutionalized into urban planning regimes, um, that could un en enable or, or allow to thrive even more all sorts of urban activities potentially, because you're trying you're trying to rescale urban development. Maybe car clubs wouldn't feature in that kind of city. You know, because if you're living largely in a 20 minute urban environment where you can walk, it just takes you 20 minutes to walk to yeah. green spaces, to schools, et cetera, to arts and cultural centers, whatever. So, um, but if you like, where's the pressure for that that 20 minute city to come from? It's Some of it's probably come from urban movements, you know, people mobilizing and campaigning for the rights of the city, green, uh, green cities. Some of it's coming from urban professionals and and from policy so it's this sort of conf confluences of how these uh, norms come about and but then i think in a complicated ways to have confidence that a norm like that is feasible and there's support and actually it would bring forward a future that's actually really desirable that really taps into people's aspirations and it's not about well you shouldn't do this or shouldn't do that because it's bad for the environment it's actually we if we do this it's going to just improve life for all of us it may create new forms of work etc or we need to work less whatever yet so um and now i've lost my thread a bit but those those processes oh yeah those processes are incredibly complex but also to have confidence that those sorts of change in norms are feasible maybe you need examples and initiatives, material examples, initiatives that you can point to 
and say, you know, if we change urban planning norms in this way, then there might be more of this and more of this. And people can see and almost like touch and feel and experience um, what it's like to have their, their street pedestrianised, for example, or what it's like to have green spaces. And and that's being used, isn't it? You know, you, you, you see in urban developments, um, people temporarily inserting, intervening in spaces and creating temporary um, civic spaces to get people to just experience it and see what it's like. And then maybe it's removed after a period of months. But I think you probably find that a lot of them tend not to get removed because people like it. I agree. So, so, yeah. So I think grassroots innovators should be a bit more confident that alternatives can become the base, the basis, or can lead to radical change. Because as an historian, I'm struck by the fact that in the 50s, people were walking much longer distances in the Netherlands than driving by car. And I'm not even talked about bicycling. Uh, so the first cars, when they came, was it was a grassroots innovation, in fact. Uh, the, the, there was a whole movement of, of, of mm -hmm. uh, people who want to push through cars against the elite and against the will of a lot of people. Uh, so personally, I think that grassroots innovation can become a source for uh, a new type of mainstream. And yeah, and no, it's interesting. But then maybe we need to unpack what what we mean by grassroots innovation, because yes. if you look at specific initiatives or networks of initiatives, it's it's incredible. It can be incredibly hard work. You know, you're not really supported institutionally. It's an uphill struggle. And so specific initiatives may come and go. You know, it's hard to get investment or resources um, if you're doing it as a voluntary effort. You know, people can burn out or energy. So. It's a real struggle in some cases. In others, you know, there are resources and support to make it happen in other instances. So I think for some of the things you're, you know, probably both of us would like to see more of, if, if in the sense of this social redistribution of prototyping capabilities and, uh, you know, allowing to kind of materialize new sustainability norms, we may need to rethink the institutions of innovation or yeah. you know how how do you um well what might a kind of inst innovation institutions or science technology and innovation institutions that accompany and empower grassroots innovation and the circulation of the development of these capabilities in societies what might they look like what would their be their characteristics be and then you know, how do we get from here to there? You know, how do you bring these things about? Who who are the kind of uh, agents in those sorts of initiatives? And um, yeah, so that I, that's now, these are important questions. Question. Mm. I mean, in my thinking, these institutions are these rules in the deeper sense, because these rules represent the values and the beliefs of people. Uh, and these lead to certain type of behavior. So in a deeper sense, it's about value change, change of values and a change of beliefs uh, that will then be expressed in new type of governance arrangement, new type of regulations and a new culture, uh, but, which but, will then but, be a new type of behavior. But then how deep <laughs> Do the values have to go to gain widespread sort of social legitimacy, or do they, or do they, um, or to have some sort of power and the influence of, of the scope and scale that you you say? Because I wonder if if it's like okay, the value needs to be um, circularity. So it's a norm around circularity in the manufacture and use of artifacts. Okay, and so. Lots of people are signing up to that, but there's tremendous debate about what that really means in practice. How does that shift in rule, as you call it, manifest in practice? Yeah, is it on the one hand just um, multinational companies enclosing further 
material cycles. It's just about securing. They're worried that, that, about raw materials diminishing and they just want to secure the minerals they need to stay in business long term. So there's this kind of global, you know, enclosed materials flows. Or could we think of circularity or the materials as, as a commons? What would a commons based circularity look like? where you kind of borrow materials from the commons for a while, but then you have to restore them back to the commons. Are we talking about circularity in terms of materials like that, or are we talking about circularity in terms of artefacts? So remanufacturing things locally. So this norm of circularity is then about, OK, well, if you're going to be able to repair, remanufacture, reform artefacts locally that people have, because if you think currently, Goods come from quite centralized services and they're just the logistics are incredibly sophisticated for getting them around the world. But then at that end of use, if you want to then remanufacture it, but you don't really want to transport it all the way back to the centers of production, you actually need to think about versatile local remanufacturing capabilities Yeah, that, that can deal with all sorts of heterogeneous stuff and fix them up and reuse them and make them attractive to people to carry yes. on using. So. My point here is that this value of circularity can be taken in all sorts of different directions, can't it? And with all sorts of different implications about social and environmental sustainability, they're not all the same thing. So I wonder how these deep transitions will, will, will play out. And if we think about like modernity as a kind of set of deep norms, that's played out in a very conflicted way over the last 200, 300 years, hasn't it? I mean, you, you're, you're the historian, Yoel, you've written about these things. So I, I but I, do you know what I mean? So if we think about, if you, th if you think about first deep transition norms and the plurality of ways they may have played out and conflicted, and I wonder how some of the new norms we, we really need for a sustainable world, a world that's going to be last through a, a second deep transition, how will they play out, do you think? Well, I think it's important to say that there always will be a variety of practices. Even within the mainstream, there can be a, a variety of ways of delivering on the mainstream. The idea is that there is a deeper norm which creates a bias. At the moment, the deeper bias is producing waste is fine. You can either recycle or you can just dump or burn and that's fine. If the deeper norm is that's not fine, that's a problem. Then the question is, OK, how do we deliver on that? And then there will be a variety of practices. But at least you have a kind of new boundary. You have a new direction. And and then you can become less or more radical, which is in the end again a political process partly uh, but you do switch in a way the field and the the center of gravity of the field is switching from linear production to circular production and consumption uh, which makes the inquiry for solutions different and will create more scope for grassroots innovators to be successful and uh, we society people need space for exploration what is the best solution in each context uh, so to answer your question is very difficult i'm interested in when is the shift taking place from one deeper norm to the other and part of the thinking is that well in one of my articles with kutya yang we say 16 percent of adoption so system because if something becomes the norm other people imitate or appropriate or uh, or are forced violently to fall into line that's what yes. history teaches us yes uh, but there's a fine line between brute co coercion and soft of course because if you build mm. laws and if you build institutions that expect a certain behavior it's a form of power and force and mm. well i'm i think that's necessary uh, the question is the process what is the quality of the process and is there scope for deviant behavior and variety uh, so how is the force executed uh, but we need some type of force and well there's always force 
in every configuration. Mm. So, uh, but then you know it's interesting talking like this because then it's making me think. Well, because if you like, just by the nature of the research on grassroots innovation, it's about this relationship between what you you know may call the, the the regime or these deep norms, if you like, and there, if if you like, the grassroots is always challenging and contesting the way that a, a, a norm or a dominant way of doing things is playing out. So if you like, by sort of definition, it's always the grassroots is being produced in relationship with that norm. So to to yes. expect expect the grassroots to become or these grassroots innovation to become the new norm would kind of they cease then to be this kind of grassroots innovation. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant here because um, I'm not sure. Andy, it may limit it li limits this um, the, the 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 meaning of, of grassroots. But there's this sort of issue here of of contestation or struggle or always contending. Because I don't know whether I'm not an expert on circular economy, so I haven't research it but things I've read so maybe this is but if you like if if power institutions incumbents are really hard to shift and they can appropriate as capital does you know capitalism you know is highly it, it will just it will can, it can adapt and that's it's it's sort of key to its success you know it doesn't care about many things or it can care about some things and drop others and so forth for as long as it's able to accumulate and reproduce itself um so it will always sort of appropriate these things, and to the extent that it is powerful, then there'll always be this struggle to say, okay, well that's great, you're investing in wind energy, but this isn't really addressing uh, inequalities or any injust injustices, or this is an appropriation of of uh, you know the the commons of wind 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 resources, so daylight or so forth, you know. So there will always be these contestations and people trying to do developments in according to different criteria or different ways if you like yeah so I, I guess the the question is whether just how revolutionary we can be here or how, what your expectations are for that whether that those powers can be overthrown and democratized or not well if you look at take a long-term historical perspective the factory production was once grassroots because uh, specialty production, craft production, was the dominant trend and was protected in laws. And if you would do factory production, you could become end up in jail, in fact. Uh, so the factories, you know, uh, owners uh, violated many norms and regulations. Mm -hmm. And they, what they got is a lot of demonstrations and even machinery, you know, uh, sh smashing. And they won in the end. So they became, after a long process, uh, mass production became the dominant uh, trend. Uh, so I think it is possible to conceive of the fact that what you call grassroots innovation in your work, a specific type of uh, production and consumption could become the dominant incumbent trend and you need to justify in such a context to globalize so it's the opposite no absolutely i mean there's um i read something recently no it's interesting you i don't know if you've read it but you you should do it might there's um he's at the university of napoli adam arvidson i think he's a sociologist or media and he says he contrasts the current epoch with the 16th century i believe oh. and so arguing um how, I mean, again, I'm not a historian, so I couldn't speak um, knowledgeably about the 16th century. But what you were saying there about, you know, guilds and um, uh, ways of organising production, and he argues that was relatively commons based. You know, people would share tools. There were limits on how you could do things. And he saw this as a commons and eventually capital usurped it, enclosed it and developed in ways, you know, that you said. I mean, and. But there's always then existed that sort of flexible 
specialization or there's been bits of the of, of the world like maybe in parts of northern Italy where you've always had these networks of producers and Arvidsson contrasts that so he, he sets that up and he can characterize that and he said rather than thinking about the current crisis in relation to say the 1920s and 30s or whatever he says you need to go back to the 16th century and the dawn of modernity and capitalism where there was all this stuff going on and he's interested in that because he also looks at what's happening now where some of the new centers of in, in industrial economy and industrial are no longer absorbing workers you know in like china and so forth and he's noticing all sorts of what he calls an industrious class or an industrious milieu who are using some of these much these versatile small scale design and manufacturing technologies and manufacturing plants to do kind of petty production and almost and, and a lot of it's about sharing designs and knowledge or hacking open proprietary designs and selling knockoff fake mobile phones to markets and so forth and he's kind of saying there's this sort of industrious millionaire and he's not sort of speculating on where that's going but it's interesting how uh this kind of coexistence and it's almost like the, this industrious milieu they're using the tools and technologies of, of of industrial society but but in quite different ways or to either to find livelihoods or to become social entrepreneurs and address social pro you know do projects to address social issues and so forth so there's this sort of ferment going on there and it just looks very different if you like to say the vision of the world economic forum for the fourth industrial revolution and these global logistic systems and and data running and controlling the way the environments are perceived as raw materials and and so on and so forth and things are made so maybe these things have always kind of coexisted if you like um, yes I, I think throughout that's what i throughout the first deep transition alternatives continue to exist and your work has documented some of these alternatives mm. And I also think that your work uh, shows the potentiality of uh, an alternative development, uh, which I believe can be radical and is possible if you take a long term perspective, you realize uh, that really big shifts have happened in history. Uh, so I really uh, value this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, Adrian, and uh, I would urge people to read your work. Okay. Well, uh, because it shows uh, the vitality of a number of alternative currents or undercurrents, and uh, ask questions about their pertinence and their relevance uh, for the contemporary world. So, uh, thank you for the conversation. No, thank you, Jan. It's been good talking, and um, let's do it again sometime soon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. bye.